So I'm absolutely thrilled uh, to be joined uh, this evening by Mark Morial, the CEO and President of the uh, National Urban League, and uh, Nicole Turner-Lee, fellow here at the Brookings Institution. And I want to just formally introduce them. So uh, Mark Morial, obviously, is the current uh, CEO and President of the National Urban League. He also served as the mayor of New Orleans from 1994 to 2002. He's uh, been an entrepreneur, a lo lawyer, professor, legislator, mayor, president of the US Conference of Mayors, and CEO of the National Urban League, the na nation's largest civil rights organization. In a distinguished professional career that has spanned over 25 years, Mark has performed all of these roles with excellence and is one of the most accomplished servant leaders in the nation. As mayor of New Orleans, Morial was a popular chief executive with a broad multiracial coalition who led New Orleans 1990s renaissance and left office with a 70% approval rating. With vigor and creativity, he passionately attacked his city's vast urban problems. Violent crimes and murders dropped by 60%. The unemployment rate was cut in half, and New Orleans' poverty rate fell according to the 2000, 2000 census. As president and CEO of the National Urban League since 2003, he has been the primary catalyst for an era of change, a transformation for the early 100-year-old civil rights organization. His energetic and skilled leadership has expanded the League's work around an empowerment agenda, which is redefining civil rights in the 21st century with a renewed emphasis on closing the economic gaps between whites and blacks, as well as rich and poor Americans. His creativity has led to initiatives such as the Urban Youth Empowerment Program to assist young adults in securing sustainable jobs and entrepreneurship centers in five cities to help the growth of small businesses. Also, Mark created the National Urban League Empowerment Fund, which has pumped almost $200 million into urban impact businesses, including minority businesses, through both debt and equity investments. A graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with a degree in economics and African American studies, he also holds a law degree from the Georgetown University Law Center here in Washington, D.C., as well as honorary degree from Xavier University, Wilberforce University, and the University of South Carolina Upstate. I want to also introduce my colleague, uh, Nicole Turner-Lee. Dr. Nicole Turner-Lee is a fellow in the, at the Brookings Institution Center for Technology, Innovation, and a contributor to Tech Tank. At the Center for Technology and Innovation, Dr. Turner-Lee researches public policy designed to enable equitable access to technology across the U.S. and to harness its power to create change in communities across the world. Dr. Turner-Lee's research also explores global and domestic broadband deployment, regulatory, and internet governance issues. She is also an expert on the intersection of race, wealth, and technology within the context of civic engagement, criminal justice, and economic development. She came to Brookings from the Multicultural Media, Telecom, and Internet Council, a na national nonprofit for organization uh, and national nonprofit organization dedicated to prom promoting and preserving equal opportunity and civil rights in the mass media, telecommunications, and broadband industries, where she served as vice president and chief research and policy officer. In this role, she led the design and implementation of their research policy and adv advocacy agendas. And prior to joining MMTC, Dr. Turner Lee was vice president and the first director of the Media and Technology Institute at the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies, the nation's leading think tank on issues related to African Americans and other people of color. In this role, she led the technology research agenda that was focused on advancing digital equity and inclusion for historically disadvantaged populations. Dr. Turner Lee graduated from Colgate University magna cum laude and has an MA and PhD in sociology from Northwestern University. So please, let's welcome both of them. So I, uh, I just want to preface this by saying that we are going to, I'm going to ask um, our panelists actually two questions. And then with the remaining time, I'm going to try to open it up to Q&A. But I have already chatted with both of them. And one of the things that I want them to reflect on 
uh, coming from very different perspectives, is we are in a context now. This is where we've had a black president for eight years, um, where we continue to see uh, the legacies of structural racism and inequality, where we now understand very clearly the dimensions of psychological racism, where we, we now know, as Dr. Gates pointed out, that black boys and their treatment and their futures are central to where this country stands in terms of economic participation and social participation. We now have been uh, lucky to have witnessed a moment where folks have stood up and said, black lives matter. But at the same time, we are still seeing the Stephen Clarks of the world. And we are still seeing people being thrown out of Starbucks just for being black. Mm -hmm. So I just want to preface this question, noting, as Dr. Gates has, that we have had, we've experienced both progress and we're seeing, seeing a lot of the same stuff that we've seen before. So I want us to reflect on, in that context, what are the strategies that have been successful in the civil rights agenda and advocacy, and what are the strategies that have not served us well? And what are the strategies that we should be employing in this kind of post-Charlottesville world where people do not feel any compunction about marching with tiki torches without masks. So I'm going to ask each of you to reflect on that. And I'd like to start first with Mark. Well, let me just say uh, a great thanks to Brookings, mm -hmm. to you, Dr. Gates, mm -hmm. these two brilliant scholars I'm between <laughs> up here uh, for all of their incredible work, and certainly to all of you. Uh, Dr. Gates sort of, you know, he, he, he mentioned this in what we saw. Why should we be surprised? American history is once again repeating itself. The Reconstruction period and important years of progress, uh, black political progress, uh, black economic progress. We had 22 black members of Congress. We had a black governor in Louisiana, two black lieutenant governors, African-American members of the United States Senate from 1868 to really 1900. And then all of a sudden, uh, during that period of time, there's, there was this massive resistance. We went from Abraham Lincoln to Andrew Johnson. And progress took place. And then there was a period where massive resistance took hold. The right to vote was stripped, the right to own property, the American system of apartheid, which is what segregation was, took hold. Then we had a movement uh, which uh, recorded its first victory on May 17, 1954, mm -hmm. with the Brown versus the Board of Education decision. And then Montgomery, in a period of 13 years from uh, 54, from 54, really 14 years to 68, where we had a Voting Rights Act, we had a, we had a Civil Rights Act, we had a Fair Housing Law, we had a war on poverty, we had tremendous, if you will, social and economic change uh, that, that formulated in the country as a result of a movement uh, that took place. And then we had the Richard Nixon, George Wallace victory of 1968, where between the two of them, they captured over 50% of the vote, and there was a period of resistance, resistance to busing, uh, political talk of repealing the Civil Rights Act. There were constitutional challenges in the courts to the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act in the late 1960s and the early 1970s. And we had a period of, if you will, resistance. And then you had the Reagan era, where you had resistance finding itself into the legitimacy of White House and national public policies. Then we had the Obama 
years, which punctuated a tremendous victory. And now the resistance that we see, we are seeing, if you will, a repeat in American history. I'll give you some political analogies. Uh, 1968 election, the only way Richard Nixon won that election was because of George Wallace. Without George Wallace, he would not have won that election because those southern states that George Wallace carried would have gone to Hubert Humphrey, a three-way race. In 2016, 2016, Donald Trump would not have won if Jill Stein was not on the ballot. Would not have won if Jill Stein, period, do the math, the arithmetic is simple. These analogies, these ballot box arithmetic, these ballot box, we've got to acknowledge that these, these presidential elections, some people said it didn't matter who won in 2016. I tell you, hell yeah, you know now it matters. <laughs> because every single day, there's another public policy. There's another announcement. Mm -hmm. Forget the drama on TV. Mm -hmm. I'm watching what's coming out of the departments. Right. I'm watching the guidances that are being repealed. Mm -hmm. I'm watching the executive orders that are being signed. The legitimate public policy, if you will, uh, 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 backlashes uh, that are taking place. Uh, I have been and continue to be a strong believer in every strategic tactic necessary. <clears throat> Protesting is crucial and important, but alone is not going to bring about change. Mm -hmm. 19, the 1950s and 60s included protests along with crucial litigation that was challenging by the NAACP Legal Defense Fund while King was marching, Thurgood and his allies were in court. Protest counts. Litigation counts. Elections matter. Don't just look at the presidential elections. Look at the significant changes. I was a mayor of a city. My father was a mayor of a city. You look at the cities of Atlanta, you look at cities like New Orleans, and you can look at the changes that took place as a result of political progress in those cities. Not perfect, not perfect. I'm not gonna suggest that that eliminated all problems. So I think every single reasonable strategy has to be employed. Coalition building makes a difference. The struggle for progress needs allies, mm -hmm. needs alliances. Always allies and alliances have made a difference in bringing about progress. Whether it was in abolition, whether it was in civil rights. Don't forget that in, 19, in 2008, Barack Obama carried a majority of the white vote in 12 states. Mm -hmm. In 12 states in that election. Alliances are crucial and important. So that's really, when we think about where we are today, it requires a multiplicity of efforts, all hands on deck, all, if you will, tactics and strategies that are reasonable, that are necessary, and that make sense. That's what history demonstrates. Uh, sometimes these strategies are not perfectly coordinated. <laughs> sometimes it's not like a beautiful orchestra of music. <laughs> many times it looks messy, and many times within, if you will, within all of those that are doing work, there are debates about what tactics and strategies work. I've sat in many seats. I was an anti-apartheid protester in the 1980s, right? I was an activist lawyer bringing civil rights lawsuits. Wore well, that hat too. I was a person that chose elected office and served in a legislative body and then as mayor of New Orleans. Then I'm here leading a national civil rights. I've worn many hats because I believe that every reasonable tactic and strategy has to be employed in this movement, not only for civil rights, 
but for justice and freedom and for a vision of an America that is for all people. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mark. Nicole? Darn, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> I just started with a right. question. <laughs> well, I, I know you could go on. But <laughs> I know. Well, I have the, the pleasure. He's one of my mentors. Uh, Mark has been with me since my career in Washington and before. Um, as Camille said, I spend most of my time doing technology, but I actually have a civil rights uh, roots because I'm a sociologist. And in the exploration as a sociologist, you're always looking for what is sort of at the heart of situations that reflect upon disparity. And so I've committed my life's work to that. Um, and here at Brookings, continue to have that conversation on technology and when other things come up. I'm gonna shift it a little bit because I was a baby when Martin Luther King uh, died. I wasn't even born. I mean, I'm mm -hmm. trying not to tell you my age, but I'm getting close <laughs> um, if I kind of share what month I was born after he died. But, you know, part of what I remember about that experience, and I sort of want to take what Mark talked about uh, and the good points that he brought up, but just to reflect on where we are today. I mean, my dissertation was about me. It was about a child that grew up in 60, 68 to be exact, who did not march, who had not protested, but I was a beneficiary of the civil rights movement. My parents had went to historically black colleges. They were the first to go to school. Here I come along, I wanted to go to Howard. My daddy said, no, you gotta go to Colgate because I marched for you to go to Colgate versus Howard. I was that person who had lived on the coattails of the civil rights movement. I didn't have to suffer. Because at that time, I didn't understand what suffering meant. I lived in a black community in New Rochelle, New York, a black street, you know, down the street with black neighbors who were employed, the, the local barbershop. Ruby D and Ati Davis lived in our street at some point. We were like high cotton black middle class folks mm -hmm. because the community in which it was structured, it gave us hope, it gave us authenticity, mm -hmm. it gave us power. We didn't have to leave our community to do certain things when I grew up. My neighborhood school, Mayflower School, everybody was actually knew each other, went to the same church. And if you got in trouble, Miss Williams had a, a paddle about this big, and it was okay for her to spank you in school because guess what? She knew your mom. When I left Mayflower in 60, I was trans transferred via bus to a new school. And I think when I did my dissertation on the plight of the black middle class post civil rights, sort of unfolded, I think, a lot of what we see in the documentary, uh, thanks to another one of my favorites, Dr. Gates, but also, you know, what Mark is talking about. We're seeing black people under siege. That moment of optimism, of hope, of communities that were collectively together. My mother is one of 15. We didn't have class differences because, you know, my cousin may have lived in the projects, but they still came to the cookout. There was not that distinction between who we were because being black was a beautiful thing, and it still is. But along the way, as Mark said, in that uh, land in which I lived, where I was very much protected, reality set in. When I went to Colgate, I became a fighter for apartheid. Maya Angelou came to Colgate. Stokely Carmichael came to Colgate. People who I had read about came to Colgate. In a school of 3,000, only 85 people of color, plural, about 15 African-American students. It was probably one of the most horrific parts of my life that committed me towards social justice. Because what I saw was this inequality of being that person who lived in this neighborhood where everybody enjoyed each other, where there was no uh, explanation for who we were. Fast forward as a mother now of two, as Mark said, and I'll talk about strategies in a minute, I live in a community where my kids are under siege. I sent my son just the other day to Starbucks to wait for his tutor, and I had to give him money because I wasn't sure what was going to happen. This is now 2018. I lived through the effects of segregation along with many of my friends who landed up at Princeton and Harvard, who hit a glass ceiling, and this was my dissertation was about the glass ceiling that the black middle class met, and the fact that when we were growing up, we were told to go to a good school, live in a good neighborhood, find a nice partner, because social mobility was ours. But later we found that that's not the truth. And I think what Mark is really speaking of is this entrenched reminder of what it means to be black. We are 50 years beyond the assassination of Martin Luther King, less than one year of Charlottesville, less than two days of Starbucks, and maybe one week, if we go back and we look at the stuff I do, one week of people of color being manipulated by the Russians. 
playing upon the vulnerabilities of race relations in this society. These are serious issues that are so obscured today. I mean, Camille, to your point, the strategies become much more complicated and sophisticated. The challenges that we have to play and the, the challenges that we're up against and the strategies that we have to employ are different strategies. They're not necessarily only protesting. What we saw in the last week is people exercise the value of their dollar to say that they were going to go someplace else. Problem was we had no place to go <laughs> and put our money that was in the black community. Again, a product of integration and the desegregation of institutions. We have schools. You know, my son in particular, I made the choice to put him in public school, knowing the statistics of putting an African-American boy in public school. I'm here to tell you, I'm still going through everything that I read about. But I'm determined to not have him become that statistic. But again, I still have to deal with that. That's sort of that Chetty report, right? Regardless of the ceilings that I've broken personally and people around me, we still have to deal with the fact that I cannot transfer wealth because of the wealth gaps that exist, the silver spoon that I did not get. I got education. That is supposed to be the uh, point that breaks the trajectory of poverty which we all should support, mm -hmm. but I mm -hmm. still inherited my blackness. I want to end on here, because I know I can't talk as long as Mark. I don't have that <laughs> privilege. <laughs> Although you in my place now, right? <laughs> this is your house. This is your house. <laughs> but what I was going to say about that, I mean, I think part of the challenge that we have today, Camille, to your problem, we talk about strategies. I think Mark is completely right. We have to continue to employ strategies that worked in the past voting rights and the preservation of voting rights, even though the worst case of voter suppression came through Russian interference, just trying to tell you, right? Because we couldn't even identify that that was happening to us. That wasn't something we could take to the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. But we have to continue traditional strategies of what worked before. It's working with Black Lives Matters and more coalitions around gun reform. We're actually seeing that, that catalyst where people actually are still getting out there. As John Lewis say, we're still getting out there and ruining our shoes to make sure that people hear us. At the same time, I think it's really important for us to understand that explicit racism and discrimination no longer comes seen. It's unconscious. Um, I could talk about in terms of black PhDs. We still suffer in the black PhDs, less than 5% of us that actually get a degree. We are seeing this upward trajectory of black women, for example, in education with educational opportunities, but that still suggests that we have more to do. We have to change the paradigm of what unconscious bias actually does to us. Carter G. Woodson said, if, you don't create, if they don't create the door, the back door, you're going to create it for yourself. That's essentially what many of us are doing, because we've not yet seen the impact of unconscious bias. My colleague, Andre Perry, and we talk all the time about paradigm shifting. Instead of looking at the glass half empty, let's look at it half full. Let's stop painting these portraits of black men who are just incarcerated, and let's talk about the number of young men from Morgan State that actually get engineering degrees. Mm -hmm. That's a mm -hmm. shift of the paradigm of the black experience. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then I also think it's important that we look at our, our economic wealth. We have trillion dollar capacity as African Americans as consumers. We can decide as African Americans where to spend our dollar. We can shut down businesses. I was telling somebody Starbucks to me was rem reminiscent of the Woolworth counter. Waiting why black happened in the 60s, waiting why black happened just a couple of days ago. Mm -hmm. But we can make that decision to take our dollars elsewhere. And I would say the last thing what I focus more on is we've got to get access to new tools. Technology is the driver for recreating the narrative of the 21st century. Mm -hmm. If you are not online, you're not in the conversation. To date, there are 11% of Americans who are offline, disproportionately people of color, people who are disabled, poor, less literate, older Americans, those 11% sit in this space called of digital invisibility. And that digital invisibility creates this pathway where they're excluded from what we saw. Michael Harrington talked about the other America when he talked about the war on poverty, about people being undercounted. I'd say the new war on poverty is against the digitally disconnected, who cannot engage in civil society, cannot find a job, cannot get the health care, simply because they lack an access to technology. So I would say there, we've got to level the playing field to, to ensure that they have access. Thank you. Got me all choked up. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'm going to open it up for a very short Q&A. 
Um, the last, the second question is around a topic that Nicole just raised, which is that we know that the economy is certainly increasingly digital uh, and knowledge and tech driven. And so my question is, what do you think are the most effective ways for positioning African Americans economically and financially to claim their space in this new economy? So we're going to go start with you, Nicole. And I'm, I'm going to be kind of vicious on okay. the time. Okay, I know. We'll, so, uh, I, okay. won't, I won't do my sermon. <laughs> People who know me know I go on for a long time on technology. <laughs> so I promise I won't get on my soapbox. So I think you're right. I mean, I think the key thing is that um, when I look at the technology space, we've actually gone into this disruptive age where it's not only affecting what used to be give a person a computer, make sure they have internet. It's not a binary conversation anymore. Technology's become so sophisticated that you sit within the ecosystem of getting things done. How many people in here order an Uber? Just raise your hand. How many people use Airbnb? Raise your hand. How many people go on social media? Raise your hand. How many of you use the dating sites? Okay, I'm not gonna push you out. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna keep you out, I'm not gonna call you out, right? But I say all that to say, imagine if you're disconnected, your, your life is blind your disadvantage. And so Camille, to your point, recognizing that there's the consumer side in terms of how am I consuming technology products that help me with my learning and, and engage me. But then there's this really scary side of it, which is if I don't have access to technology, I cannot work. I cannot engage the economy in a way where it creates efficiency. When I take an Uber from here to Capitol Hill, it costs me $6. When I take a taxi, it costs me 20. If I'm a single African-American woman, of which I am, who is of low resources, that $20 just took food off of my table. And so the deeper that people go into technology efficiency, and as we move into some of my work is on artificial intelligence, algorithmic bias, we all are the product. But when poor people and black people are not part of the suite in the ecology of information, they become the product that's bypassed. Uber doesn't come to their neighborhood. Jobs don't enter into their community, the skill set. There's a cost of digital exclusion. So I think, Camille, to your point, we've got to figure out ways to move people as consumers of technology to producers of the technology, which is, I think, why Mark and NUL have been very, very adamant, and Reverend Jackson around, how do we get more diversity into these companies so that we ensure that we have people who are pulling people up versus you know, basically putting us under a microscope as, as part of the data that fuels the new economy. Thank you, Nicole. So let me just uh, give you all a little highlight. So our entire State of Black America yes. report, which will be released, your contributor, on May 8th is dedicated to the digital revolution. Mm -hmm. And we are gonna release a digital equality index, mm -hmm. which is gonna measure the disparities. And I'll give you a little tease. Uh, African Americans over index as users, mm -hmm. owners, and consumers of these devices a handheld, mobile, I call it computer. Mm -hmm. African Americans seriously under index when it comes to jobs in the tech sector writ large. Very low numbers. 4.5% of all jobs. The trick and the challenge and the work is in what you said, which is for people of color, particularly African Americans and Latinos, to become producers, owners, uh, participants in the largesse, in the wealth, and in the opportunity that the tech sector is creating. The new tech sector, which are the new companies that we all know, the Facebooks, the Googles, and the Amazons, are far behind the diversity revolution. Far behind the diversity revolution. Many of these companies, just within the last 12 months or so, have added African Americans to their boards. Uh, very few of them have had long-standing chief diversity officers or meaningful relationships with African-American institutions, educational, civic, and civil rights institutions. So we're going to challenge them 
uh, if you will. Now, what is interesting, though, is that many of what mon people might call the old tech companies, the broadband service providers, right, like Comcast, AT&T, and Verizon, some of them have the most diverse boards. Some of them have longstanding commitments to diversity that puts them far ahead when you index their numbers to these new tech companies. This is the frontier. I am not simply interested in people in my community being consumers. We have to be the producers. We have to be the owners. If tech is going to cause jobs to disappear, then we have to ensure that the jobs that are going to be created are going to be jobs with, with whom and with which African Americans and other people of color have meaningful and real access to. We have and we produce North Carolina A&T, Xavier University, to name two, and many others are producing African Americans with backgrounds in sciences. There's not, uh, is there a pipeline? There's a pipeline. There's absolute, is it what it ought to be? No, it's not what it ought to be. But there's a pipeline of people, and then tech does not just create tech jobs. Tech companies hire lawyers, payroll specialists, finance experts, marketing experts, salespeople. They're like any other enterprise. So these numbers in these companies are not just driven by tech jobs, traditional tech jobs. It's a larger conversation. So we're going to have that conversation. Uh, this year's State of Black America report will be, re will be released on May the 8th. Uh, we are going to tape a television show that's going to appear on May 30th on TV One. Uh, we're going to release a report, an online report. We've got 50 authors, including the dynamic Nicole Turner Lee, that we're going to feature, uh, who will be writing on all of these subjects. We're going to focus on not only the digital divide, but where is the digital opportunity? Where is this revolution? Is it going to be televised? But it is going to be online. All right. So we unfortunately do not have a lot of time for q and I'm going to take two questions. Um, let me first preface this by saying they need to be questions, and they need to be succinct. OK? Thank you. So I, I'm going to take this gentleman over here and the person way in the back with the white uh, sleeve and the black sweater. So way back there. So right here, gen this gentleman here. Mm -hmm. So we're going to take the two questions, and then we'll answer. I'll tr I will try to be succinct. Um, so I'm going to frame it first. There was an essay I read a while ago called The End of the Black American Mar Narrative. We can't, is, uh, can't hear you. Am I? There's an essay I read a while ago called The End of the Black American Narrative. It was basically um, made the point that as a matter of political praxis, it becomes increasingly difficult to, to have a narrative of, he used the language of victimology, but to, to have a politics based on grievance um, for black Americans in the face of all the successes of Obama and Oprah, and if you will. Whether it was right or wrong, just, it's difficult to make that case. Now, I use that to frame it because you made the point about um, coalitions and the importance of that as a strategy. And one of the things that a lot of my friends say or tell me is that um, with the current political climate, um, it's alienating to a lot of would-be allies because they feel like they can't engage with this um, tone. They feel like they're shut out, et cetera, et cetera. And so how do you, I guess, suggest um, reconciling the truth of the matter that a lot of progress comes with um, discomfort, with the fact that some of that discomfort may be alienating would-be allies that you need um, to build coalitions, to get votes, to get things done. Let me address this. this I mean, let's take both yes. questions first, and then we can go. Um, so in yeah. the way in the All back right. there, yeah. Thank uh, you. Bill Cunningham, this is going to be a little rough. Just want to warn you. That's okay. You guys missed Black Lives Matter. You missed Me Too also. And I'm talking Urban League. I'm talking NAACP. I'm talking Operation Push. Part of the reason why you missed them was because for this demographic, those organizations don't have a lot of authenticity. And what I mean by that is if you look at the partnerships 
that, say, Urban League did with Wells Fargo in the years leading up to the crisis that resulted in a 61% decline in African-American wealth, that might have led the people in this demographic that I'm talking about to figure out that they needed to create their own institutions. So what's your strategy going forward to address some of those types of disconnects? Let me just address this. Just because somebody contributes to us, just like somebody contributes to a university, it doesn't dictate what their scholars do. So if you contribute to us, it doesn't dictate our public policy. That's what you have to be clear and understand. The second thing over here, I just want to address this. See that grievance, uh, victimology conversation? That's Fox Fox News alternative right rhetoric, right? That somehow, because we raise issues of concern, we're playing the victim. Mm -hmm. Because we assert uh, uh, challenges to American society that we're in the grievance class. I reject wholeheartedly that terminology because it's another spin meister initiative, right? We're going to spin what they're doing to discredit them. I'll say this about your question around coalition building. You know, we have to build coalitions with people who are sincerely interested, sincerely interested and honest in addressing the challenges that America faces. I understand that that does not include everyone. And some people may choose to stand on the side and I can't do anything about it and I'm not gonna worry about it. I just wanna address this because this is what the brother in the back doesn't know. There is a conversation between the National Urban League, the NAACP and the National Action Network and Black Lives Matter and their leadership. Just because you don't see it doesn't mean that it happens. We can't let everybody peep every strategy. (laughs) And you need to understand that that's always been the case and will continue to be the case. And I welcome the fact that young people in a generation want to embrace their own initiatives and their own institutions. I don't see it as a challenge Right? Because I still have 20,000 volunteers, including 12,000 that are under the age of 40 in our young professionals, uh, if you will, auxiliary group. Right? So that's really the point. I'm not going to play in to them against us. What I'm going to do is say we will work because we're all animated by addressing the same issues Mm -hmm. and the same problems, although we may take different approaches at different times. So, wait, wait, no, let me, let's hear, let, let sorry. Me, let me you had a question, I answered. Oh, sorry, yeah. sir? Wait, sir, let sir? Me sir, right. no, let me, sir. No redirect. Wait. Sir, yeah. sir, you can take, yeah, so let me respond. Let no, me. sir, you can take that, you, you, can, you can continue the conversation afterwards. Okay, so, okay. so if I can yeah, actually please. respond, so I'll respond to both, actually. Um, so let me respond first to the grievance piece. I think that anyone who says that they don't want to work together to win the 2020 presidential election is actually living in fantasy. We all need each other to actually take back the House, take back the White House in 2020. So this whole grievance philosophy, we really have to revisit that. If we're fighting each other, as a sociologist, we basically have set ourselves up for failure. And I don't think that that's the way that we're actually seeing. And so we really need to look critically. I, I like Mark, reject that because I think there is the opportunity of flipping the apple cart to say, what is it that all of us want together? I know for a fact when I woke up the next day, I didn't feel too good. And the person across the aisle from me in, in the office didn't feel too good. And the person at my church didn't feel too good. And the cashier at the local star, you know, restaurant didn't feel too good. So I think we actually got a whole lot of people who don't feel too good that we need to move past a grievance mentality to actually mobilize. The key to taking back political power comes with voter mobilization. And I think I'm seeing a lot more energy. What we saw actually in Alabama and other places, we're actually seeing people People to come out. Uh, Doug Jones won because of African American women and men, but he also yeah, won yeah. because of millennials. And so, until we start to see that those coalitions are already forming, we're going to miss it when it comes up to this new election. 
to the gentleman back there, I actually want to just respond. And I don't work for a civil rights organization. I'm very supportive of civil rights organizations. I try to when I can pay my dues. But what I'm going to say about that is I think that that also plays into the stigma of what happened post-civil rights. I was recently um, listening to John Lewis and Juanita Abernathy give a conversation about uh, after Martin Luther King's death. And one of the things that they said is when Martin died, people didn't know what to do. And I think what we're feeding into now is the sense of we still don't know what to do. And that has less to do with, well, this organization who's more traditionally based does X versus the Black Minds Matters kids that did this. Let me tell you one thing. There's a difference in methodology. I say with Black Lives Matter, they may use a hashtag where it's traditional civil rights movement folks use, uh, you know, use other mobilization strategies. They shut down counters, et cetera. But we did see some progress with Black Lives Matters and changing the criminal justice system. We did see a voice actually rise up when it comes to protests using technology to leverage. You cannot pit either one against each other because we need both. Black Lives Matter has shown up at National Urban League functions when things have gone wrong. National Urban League has shown up other places. That's the evidence of what we're actually seeing. Just recently we saw that with the March for Our Lives. It wasn't just a white gun reform movement. It was a movement where people actually came out of different cultures. But there's a challenge, and just kind of going back to the gentleman on the Me Too movement stuff, there's a challenge when we begin to prioritize certain movements over others. That's the sociology of dysfunction, when we say that this movement is better. When Me Too came out, I was me first. I wasn't Me Too. I had already been harassed by several people before that movement came out. Nobody heard me. And it's the experiences of the oppressed that often don't get played out in popular culture or in media. So I would just tell the gentleman back, we have to be careful about the language in which we create division and areas where we don't see opportunities to collaborate. And it works both ways. We need to educate young people on what it means to take it past Twitter the same way Members of Congress need to bring in Black Lives Matter to see what they could actually do to show them how to move policy. Thank it's you, not Nicole. one or the other. Thank you very much. Thank I <laughs> Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.